Costa just does it like magic. To me, it's too much of an effort. All right, so we're getting it set up here. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jackie Green from the Chatham County Council on Aging. And um, we are, we were supposed to do today, I'm just repeating for the, for the people that are going to be hearing this on YouTube. We were supposed to do a virtual tour to my alpaca farm, but the weatherman was completely off base and I postponed it yesterday afternoon thinking we were going to have a rainy morning and being in the barn on a rainy morning is not necessarily the best way to do it. So um, we have decided, we took somebody's suggestion and we decided we were gonna try a virtual trip to the Duke Lemur Center. We were supposed to have a day trip to the Duke Lemur Center last spring, but with COVID hitting, we weren't able to do that. So instead today, we are gonna try to do that um, right now. So bear with me just a minute as I try to get, um, as I try to get this working, um, trying to figure out which screen it is. All right. All right, so I'm doing a screen share. I'm gonna go over to here. So we have um, a virtual trip to the Duke Lemur Center. So. Um, Miria and Bonnie, if you can just shake your head, do you see the screen that I wanted you to see? Okay, okay perfect. All right, I want to give a little bit of background to the people that are watching before we go to the video clips. And the video clips will be will, will be narrated by staff from the Duke Lemur Center. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the Duke Lemur Center initially. Um, so the history and mission of the Duke Lemur Center, it was founded in 1966. So it's over 50 years ago. Um, it's an internationally acclaimed non-invasive research facility, and it houses over 200 lemurs in 14 different species. And it is the most diverse population of lemurs on earth outside Madagascar, which is their native land. So Madagascar is over by, by India, I believe. Um, because of its research, because the, all of its research is non-invasive, the, the Duke Learn the Duke Lemur Center is open to the public, and they have more than 35,000 annual visitors. Um, it's highly successful cons conservation breeding program seeks to preserve the vanishing species, and I'm probably not going to pronounce these correctly, but we'll give it a try, such as the I, -I the Sapaka, and the blue-eyed black lemur. While its Madagascar conservation programs study and protect lemurs, the most endangered mammals on earth in their native habitat in Madagascar. The Division of Fossil Primates examines primal extinction and evolution over time and houses over 35,000 fossils, including extinct giant lemurs and one of the largest and most important collections of early anthropoid primates. So, this is a nice little picture here. And part of the research that they do at the Duke Lemur Center is they have peer reviewed publications and they've produced more than a thousand of these peer, re peer reviewed publications. Um, for over 35 years, the Duke Lemur Center has managed and supported um, community-based conservation in Madagascar. And if you think about any wildlife, usually what causes um, extinction is extinction of environment. So they are really working on conservation in Madagascar in, the, in that way. Um, 39 species of lemurs, lorises, bush babies, and tarsiers have lived at the Duke Lemur Center. And again, I probably pronounced those wrong, but if I did, just get um, the other thing is over the last 50 years, 3,261 threatened prosimian primates were born at the Duke Lemur Center. So just think about that. They've had over 3,200 babies born there, trying to keep these um, endangered species um, alive. Um, 400, over 400 students have trained in research 
husbandry and conservation just in the four, last four years alone. So that's pretty amazing just what kind of facility we have in our backyard. Um, the Duke Clemer Center was established, like I said, over 50 years ago as an opportunist collaboration between two researchers, one from Yale, uh, John Butner Janusz, who was studying biochemical genetics in lemurs, and a Peter Klopfer, which was a Duke University biologist studying maternal behavior in mammals. Um, and together, the two biologists conceived the idea of establishing a primate facility in the Duke Forest that would combine their research perspectives in order to explore the genetic foundations of primate behavior. Um, and at that point, the Dean of the Duke University School of Medicine, Bill Anlian, granted a large swath of the Duke Forest to the project and the National Science Foundation provided the funds to build what they consider a living laboratory where the lemurs and their close relatives could be studied intensively and non-invasively. And the non-invasively means that they can be in their more or less their natural habitat, not in cages, um, so that they can figure out how they live in their natural environment. Um, in 1966, the Duke, the Duke Lemur Center, which was then called the Duke University Primate Center, was founded on 80 wooded acres, two miles from the main Duke campus and it's kind of wild to think that in the middle of Durham, two miles from the from Duke campus is 80 acres of a refuge. Um, and this colony of lemurs or a col colony of lemurs from Butner Ganoushes, which is from um, the guy from Yale, was relocated from Connecticut to North Carolina and the Duke Lemur Center began assembling the largest living collection of endangered primates in the world, both in numbers of species and in numbers of individual animals. And I thought that was pretty amazing. Now over its history, the Duke Lemur Center has housed, cared for, and made available for non-invasive study nearly 4,000 animals across 31 species of non-human primates, including lemurs, lorises, tarsiers, together referred to as the Prosimian primates. Don't I sound knowledgeable? Um, and today it houses nearly 230 individuals across 14 species. Um, the scientific endeavors at the Duke Lemur Center span a remarkable array of disciplines from behavior and genomics to physiology and paleontology. And the center is recognized as a global authority on lemur, lemur veterinary medicine. And conservation biology is also a major focus, providing a conceptual and operational bridge between the living collections of the Duke Lemur Center and its outreach activities in Madagascar itself. So all of this information I have taken off of the Duke Lemur Center um, website, and I encourage you to go there. Um, and now we're gonna go to their Facebook page and we are gonna see, um, we're gonna go check out, if I can do this correctly. I think we we're have been there. there. You Jack, think you've been there? Yes, I think uh, we took a trip there from the Western Center. Probably, it's been quite a while, but I don't know as it was called the Lamar Center, but I remember going way out in the woods over there at Duke and I, I'm pretty certain that that's what it was. Okay, very cool. <laughs> yeah, from what I understand, they, they had taken a trip before I got there and it was one of those things that um, not ever, because it's a, it, they can only take a limited number of people. Yeah, that's true, that's true, that's, that's true. That we, we decided that we were gonna go, um, we were gonna take another trip because there were people that had wanted to go to that. So now I'm going to try to find the video that I was looking for because it didn't come on as I wanted it to. Um, hold on a second. I apologize. Thought that was going to come up just the way I wanted it to. And of course, the one I'm looking for isn't there. Isn't that the way it goes? We're gonna we're gonna pay attention to this one. 
We'll see what this one I'm sorry, there's probably an ad here to start with. Oh, nope, there he is. Awesome. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I'm... Can you hear him talking? Yes. Okay, good. And with Exploring by the Sea to be and I am so excited that you guys are back in the classroom. Students in, you know, staggered things, hybrid models, however you happen to be joining us, it is just thrilling to have kids back and to get a chance to share some of the coolest scientists, explorers, and amazing places from around the globe with you. So this month of September, we've got, I think, 40 broadcasts, which is crazy, with featuring all sorts of amazing people and places. So this gentleman, it teaches, he he focuses, it's, a, it's called... Um from around the globe and traveling while by the seat of your pants and he's making this available to students and but it's it's actually the duke lemur center has been really helpful in providing him with a lot of information that he can provide to the the educational community our main theme of the month is ocean plastic, something that we've been really covering and highlighting a lot of over the last few days. Today we're doing something quite different and we are taking a field trip to the lemur forest. So the Duke Lemur Center has been one of our biggest partners over the last few months. We have done, I think, 20 plus broadcasts with them featuring all sorts of amazing stories on lemurs live in Madagascar, from the Duke Lemur Center itself, uh, featuring fossil lemurs, all sorts of great stuff, all on our YouTube channel. So if you want to Check that out, it's all there for you. But today we are joined by Education Programs Manager, Megan, and she is gonna take us away um, momentarily and dive in in North Carolina's lemur forest. So Megan, thank you so, so much for joining us today and take us away. Absolutely, thank you for having us. Um, we've really enjoyed being a partner these past few months because we have been closed to the public and we will continue to be closed to the public through at least the end of this year since we are not a traditional setup for a zoo. Uh, we're actually primarily a non-invasive research facility. So that means we have to be extra cautious with our primates, which is the reason that I wanted to show you my face first so you can see that I'm wearing a mask. So I wear this mask not only around my coworkers um, and of course in public, but also when I'm here at the lemur center around the lemur since they're primates too. And we're not sure if they can contract COVID or how severe the symptoms would be, but we think it's possible based on research. So. We're going to take those extra precautions but now that i've introduced myself um and you've seen that i'm taking proper safety precautions i am going to oops, switch the camera so you can see what you actually came here to see there we go all right so here we have terry's and persephone they are two ring-tailed lemurs and we have terry's sitting in the front and persephone is sitting just behind um, and then right over here in a tight little lemur ball, we actually have two mongoose lemurs. That is actually two lemurs in that one spot. And the one who's kind of facing us, his name is Nacho. He's the youngest one. He's actually the son and his mom, Carolina, is curled up tight around him. I'm gonna see if I can get you a better view. There we go. You can just barely see another head popped up and moving around back there. So it's actually almost chilly last night. It was in the fifties, which is chilly in Carolina, so we're starting to get fall weather, so they're staying nice and warm. And I just saw their uh, primary caretaker, Becca, head towards their building to get food. So we're going to see her feed them in just a moment, which means that I won't have to be tromping around in this bamboo forest and we'll be able to see the lemurs a little bit more clearly. Um, so to introduce you to these two species, because I think we have a lot of new faces here, uh, we have ring-tailed lemurs, and then we have mongoose lemurs. Now, there are actually 100 different species of lemur found in the world, but they're all only found in the wild on the island of Madagascar. So here at the Duke Lemur Center, we have over 200 lemurs, representing 14 different species of lemur, 15 different species of primate actually live here. So we have the most diverse and largest population outside of Madagascar in the world here. And I am going to quickly move us over to the feeding site. You're going to see us walking around. Hopefully nobody gets vertigo as I reposition here. I promise we'll be back to the lemurs in just a moment and we'll get a nice good view of them. All right. So here you can see <laughs> we have Becca, their primary caretaker, and she did her auditory cue, which is a whistle. So she does a whistle you can hear her doing it there. She whistles two times and that says, hey, it's time for breakfast. And the lemurs know that either they need to follow her back into the building, which you can see straight down that pathway there, or they head out to the feeding site. 
So you can see Harry's is a very food motivated guy. He is following her right away. Oh, and here we have our last species joining us in the background there. We have Pompeia and Francesca. Those are our cockerel shafak. Now that is a very funny word to say, but a very impressive lemur. As you can see, they're leaping along. So I'm going to follow the cockerel shafak because they are the most unique movers we have out here at the lemur center. See those impressive leaps as they move along. So this is Pompeia closest to us. And then her daughter Francesca is mirroring her right behind and they're about to hop along to follow Becca. So these lemurs have about an acre and a half that they can explore throughout the day as long as the weather's nice and warm. All summer long they've been out here. But some of the lemurs like to steal each other's breakfast. So at breakfast time, Becca goes ahead and brings in the cockerel shafak because they get a really tasty, nice breakfast. So they come into the secondary enclosure you see right here. It's surrounded by forests. And they get to eat their breakfast in here because as you can see, Persephone and Terry's want to steal the tasty veggies out of their breakfast. And I'll explain why that is in just a minute. I'll actually show you what they get to eat for breakfast. So you can see that Pompeia and Francesca are excited about eating their breakfast. And you can also see they came right in here into the secondary space. So they don't think it's a bad thing to come in here. They think this is the fun place where they get lots of tasty treats. So they come right in. And you can see they're actually sharing pretty nicely out of their bowl. That's a little unusual for lemurs. Sometimes lemurs are, actually get very territorial about their food, but these are two females and lemurs are female dominated. And Pompeia is very good with her daughter, Francesca. They get along really, really well, but push comes to shove. If Pompeia wants this food bowl, she can absolutely shove Pom or Francesca out of the way. So again, to introduce you, the one wearing the pink collar who just hopped away is Francesca, the daughter, and then this is the mom, Pompeia, right here. But we'll see them a little better in just a moment. We're going to join the lemurs that are staying out here in the forest for their breakfast. So in front of us is Persephone. Terry's is still hanging out, watching Pompeia and Francesca eat, hoping that he can go in and steal some veggies, but he'll join us shortly. Here he comes. He's taking the long way around. And we're gonna get some nice close-up shots of Terry's and Persephone while they eat in just a minute. There's Terry's. All right, as you can see, they know exactly where the food comes from. They're excited to see Becca and get their food bowls. So let's come in and say hi. So here we have Terry snacking away on his breakfast. So you can see in that food bowl, we've actually got two different types of food. It's a type of primate chow. Sometimes we call it lemur chow, but that's specially made food, kind of like dog or cat food, especially made for dogs and cats. This food is specially made for primates. So it's actually made for animals like monkeys, apes, and lemurs. Now the types of chow they have are actually this larger biscuit, is what we call an old world monkey chow or old world primate biscuit. And it's actually a little soft and mushy because we have to soak it because it's a little hard when we first get it. And there's also lots of smaller little bits of food in that bowl. And those smaller bits of food are a folivore primate chow. And folivore means leaf eater. So folivorous um, means leaf. Um, so we can see that these guys get a mixture of those two types of chow. Um, and different lemurs get very different diets here. We have some lemurs that like to eat lots of bugs. We have some lemurs that like to eat lots of leaves. We have some lemurs that like to eat lots of fruit, but everybody has some sort of chow food that we can put in their diet. Kind of like when we eat something healthy like granola or oatmeal or something that has a lot of really healthy stuff for us, um, but doesn't necessarily look like fresh fruits and veggies. And so, there's Terry's enjoying his breakfast. I'm going to pop over so you can see Persephone, too. So Persephone has chosen to eat in the trees. And you can see she's got her bowl sitting in a nice little wire basket. Um, so this is just a little form of enrichment, which is a fancy word for 
things we put out in their space so that they can enjoy them. These are nice because these wire baskets double as not only a place to put your food, but also a place to snuggle up and take a nap. You can see she's enjoying some of her food. But as the dominant female, it looks like, yep, she's going over to see what Terry's has in his bowl. So she's sneaking around, sniffing around, seeing if he's already eaten all of her favorite bits of the chow. And right now she's being very friendly and not pushing him out of the way, but she might push him out of the way. Oh, or Terry's as the good subordinate male that he is went ahead and moved out of her way on his own. And next, I'm going to head over and introduce you to the mongoose lemurs. So they're hanging out right nearby. We call this area our feeding site. So they know that there's a general area they head into for food. So here we go. There's Nacho. He just turned around to look at us. Nacho has the orange chin or orange beard. And then his mom, Carolina, has the white chin or white beard. She also has that green collar on. A little bit uh, about the collar, since we saw a collar on a couple of the lemurs so far. That collar is not like a collar you put on a dog or a cat. These guys are definitely wild animals. That collar is a radio collar. So it emits a radio signal. So if we're not sure where the lemurs are, if it's a chilly, rainy morning and they don't feel like coming down for breakfast and Becca has to find them up in the treetops huddled up to stay warm, she can use that radio signal to track where the lemurs are, look up in the trees, find where they're huddled up nice and safe and make sure that everything's okay. So that's just a secondary way for us to find them. It's also really helpful for researchers because our biggest enclosure here is 13 acres in size. So that's a lot of space to look for if you come out here in the afternoon hoping to watch lemurs hop around in the trees. So researchers can use that radio collar to find where the lemurs are to get started on their observations way, way sooner than they would if they have to just go blindly looking in the forest for them. And let me see if I can get a little bit closer to see their diet. So you can see they've got the folivore chow. So that's the leaf eating chow. So they don't have quite the same diet. Oh, here comes Nacho. Nacho is a very mischievous little lemur. He's a few years old and he is lovingly referred to as a spicy Nacho because he does have a bit of a rambunctious personality. Just like humans, lemurs can have lots of different personalities going on. Um, so Nacho is one of our favorites living here at the lemur center, even if he does cause trouble sometimes. He actually chased Terry's through the bamboo for a little bit just for fun this morning, but nobody was hurt. He was just being a little bit of a butthead. So you can see that they're enjoying their breakfast. A little bit more about the types of lemurs we have here. So as I mentioned, these are mongoose lemurs. They are not related at all to the mongoose, the carnivore. We think that they probably just got that name because their faces look a little like little mongoose faces with those pointed noses and those kind of um, long noses. And that long nose is a really important part of being a lemur. If you look at a lemur compared to something like a monkey, or a chimpanzee or an, another ape, you're gonna see a very big difference in the shape of their face. So other primates like me and you have very flat faces and very dry noses. We don't rely as much on our sense of smell as we do on our sense of sight, but lemurs rely really heavily on their sense of smell. So that long wet nose that they have is actually more like a dog's nose than it is like our nose. And that means they can smell a lot better than we can and smell lots more information than we can, just like a dog can. So that long, wet nose is called a rhinarium. And it's actually a very key characteristic of this early, early type of primate that lemurs are part of. So it's a group called strepsirines, which is a very hard word to say and spell out loud. Um, but if anyone's curious, I can follow up with Jesse afterwards and send it to you. I just don't want to put myself on the spot to spell that out loud right now. So uh, strepsirine primates are very, very early primates that have those long, wet noses. They also have some other characteristics that are usually pretty common between them. Like all primates, they have fingernails instead of claws. There we go. Somebody spelled it for me. Thank you. Um, so they have fingernails instead of claws. And they also have one exception to that. They have a grooming claw. So these guys have a claw on the first finger of each foot. So that first toe after their thumb on each foot. And that claw is an extra tool to help them groom and get things out of their hair and out from around their face, especially. But their primary grooming tool is something called a tooth comb. So in their mouth, almost every single lemur has a tooth comb. It's six teeth 
the six incisors right at the front of your mouth on the bottom of your mouth, they have very long and skinny incisors that grow very close together and actually angle out at a 45 degree angle towards their outer lip. And so it's literally just a built-in comb that grows into their mouth and they use it just like that. They'll comb through their fur and get out any parasites, any dirt, anything like that. And they'll also groom each other using that tooth comb. So those are two really key characteristics of most strepsirines and most lemurs. There's always an exception to every rule, but that, those are some good rules to follow. All right, we spent a lot of time with Nacho and his mom, Carolina. Oh, it looks like the ring-tailed lemurs have hopped over to see if they can steal any food from our cockerel shafak, but not yet. That's the whole point of making sure the cockerel shafak go into a second space to eat. Um, let's talk a little bit about the island of Madagascar while we wait on the shipok to come out. So Madagascar is, of course, an island off the coast of Africa. But because it's next to Africa, a lot of people think it's a lot smaller than it is. Madagascar is a huge island. It's actually the fourth largest island in the world. And it is quite, quite large. It's actually about the size of the east coast of the United States. It would stretch from about the bottom of Maine to the top of Florida and be about the width of California the whole way down if you just picked it up out of the ocean and plopped it right down on top of the east coast of the U.S. Um, so it's a very, very large island. So lemurs living there have lots of options for where to live. If you're a lemur living in Madagascar, you might be specialized to live in deciduous forest. That's forest like we have here in North Carolina, where we have trees like this, these ones here, where the leaves fall off when the seasons change. So that's a deciduous tree. This is a deciduous forest with some introduced bamboo in here as well. Um, then you also might live in the tropical rainforest that's along the east coast of Madagascar. You also could live in the southern spiny desert of Madagascar, hundreds of miles away, where there's lots of big spines, not a lot of food to eat, and not a lot of water available um, because it's mostly a desert-like climate. So lemurs can live in very different places. There's even a couple of lemurs who live at higher altitudes. Um, there's even a type of fat-tailed dwarf lemur that's only found between certain altitudes at a nice high level in Madagascar. So that's why that one island has 100 different species of lemur all living in just one place. And I can hear that our doors are being opened so we can go back and say hi to our other lemurs. Although they're probably still in there eating the rest of their food. Let's see if we can say hi to our cockerel Shafak and learn a little bit about them. And then I will see if you guys have any questions. <laughs> the doors are open. They can go in and out as they please, but they're busy finishing up their breakfast. So they've decided not to leave yet. So I'll head in there with them so you can see them a little bit closer. We'll take the same trip that the lemurs took this morning. There we go. So this is Pompeia, the mom, who's sitting right here, showing off her skills, moving around, her enrichment. And then her daughter, Francesca, is still eating over here. And you may notice that they both have kind of a dark patch on their back. I believe that's from a birth control. No, not birth control. Not for them. Okay, that would make sense. So that shaved patch can mean a lot of things here at the lemur center. I paused because I was checking in with Becca, their caretaker, to see. So that shaved patch can mean that it's a birth control implant for them. But as I said that, I realized this is two girls living together, so that didn't make sense. So I think that that is actually from a research project. So we do lots of non-invasive research here at the lemur center. That means that none of our research harms the lemurs or puts them in harm's way. But sometimes that research means that they get a funny little shaved patch on their back. Some researchers like to see how fast their hair regrows or like to see something about their skin. And the lemurs don't mind that funny haircut. They don't even notice that they have a shaved patch there. Some research involves just following them around the forest and seeing what they do throughout the day. And other research might ask them to climb across a branch or do something like that. And that's when we can use positive reinforcement training to actually work with the lemurs. I'm going to move over to Francesca because Pompeii is not very fun to watch with her face buried in her food bowl. So here's Francesca. You can see her much closer. So I want to point out some really key features on the cockerel shipok. As you saw earlier, they move very differently than our other lemurs. This is a type of lemur that moves bipedally. So they move like us on two feet, bipedal, two-footed. 
So they move two footed through the forest, but they move very differently than we would. They actually have externally rotated hips. So basically their legs are always turned out so that their knees are facing out so that when they're hopping along through the trees, they can leap sideways through the trees and then latch on kind of hugging the tree and holding on. This is called vertical leaping and clinging. So they're jumping horizontally, but their body stays upright and vertical. Their shoulders stay over their hips. So these guys move in such a unique way that they're often called the dancing lemur. And they have this nice long tail to help them balance as they're moving through the trees. And that tail is just for balance. Lemurs actually don't have a prehensile tail. That's something you only see in certain types of monkeys in the New World monkeys. You're not going to see that in any other types of primates. And another really important feature on Francesca here, and I'm only getting this close because I know Francesca won't mind. I know her personality very well. So she says, yeah, that's fine. I'll just keep eating. So you can see that she's got very long legs. Now they're curled up underneath her right now. But if you look, you can see that she's got a long top of her leg, a long bottom of her leg, and then those really long feet. So those feet are very, very strong. Those legs are very strong. These guys can leap 20 feet between trees in a single bound, no problem. And there's even been reports of them leaping as far as 30 feet between trees in a single bound with no problem. So those powerful legs can launch them. But more importantly, they have gripping hands on their hands and their feet. So basically they can grasp and hold onto branches like this with their hands and their feet so that when they land after doing that impressive 20 foot jump, they're going to stick the landing, which is just as important as making that impressive jump. And these guys are from the deciduous forests in Madagascar. So they get a full of chow. They get lots of leaves in their diet. They eat lots of leaves out here in the forest. And you can see she also, she's probably eaten them all, but she also had some veggies in her food bowl this morning. So they get a much more special diet than our other lemurs, which is why they get to hang out in here so that nobody bugs them and steals their breakfast. So with that, I think I'm going to open it up to see if anybody has any questions about our lemurs. All right. Well, thank you so, so much, Megan. What a cool tour. And I, I'm spellbound. So I'm sure all the kids are too. Uh, we'll go to our live classes in a minute. We've got three groups joining us from across Ontario uh, on YouTube or Facebook. If you're watching there and you haven't let me know where you're joining from, please do. I'd love to see your questions. We've got a few questions already, which is awesome. But let's start with Madame Starris class uh, joining us in Ottawa, grade fours. If you guys have a question for us, just demute your mic and come on up and we'll be good to go. Let's see. Everyone wants a question. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Hello? Hey. Yeah, you're good to go. One question is, how many times a day do the lemurs eat? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so the answer is, we feed them all either once or twice a day, sometimes more. The lemurs who live out here in the forest, which is about a third of our lemurs who live here they get fed like this in a bowl once a day that being said they're also surrounded by an entire forest full of leaves and uh, fruit and other things and berries that grow naturally so they do snack throughout the day they're definitely grazers they spend a lot of their day grazing and snacking we also have lemurs here who live in different habitats they do have outdoor space but it's not a big forest like this and those lemurs get twi get fed twice or more every single day and they also get some form of enrichment, like a funny smell that's put in their space or a new toy, or they get their food in some sort of puzzle feeder. That way life's a little more exciting for them um, since they don't have access to these big forests to snack in there. We knew we were gonna learn a lot today and explore with this really cool animal, but the fact that spicy nacho is a butthead, which is your words, and that you put funny smells around the habitat are amazing. So thank you for that in my day. <laughs> immensely. Um, let's go to Ms. Robinson's grade six sevens in Petawawa. Welcome in guys. If you have a question for us, come on up. And a note for all our teachers, you can all demute your microphones uh, with StreamYard. When I bring you in, it's all good. You're all set to demute. Go for it, guys. Walk up to the front so I see you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> have you discovered any new species of lemurs recently? That is an excellent question. That's the first time I've gotten that question. Kudos to you. Um, so the answer is yes, there have been new discoveries recently, but those new discoveries look pretty interesting. So most of the time when we think about discovering a new species, we think about seeing an entirely new animal that no one's ever seen before and thinking, what is that? And figuring it out. 
the most recent lemur discoveries, I think, I'm not a lemur researcher, so I need to go ahead and qualify this with saying that I may not have the exact correct answer, but my best species have been small lemur species like the mouse lemurs, where they can look very similar to other mouse lemurs that might live in a different area, but through genetic testing and looking at their DNA, researchers have found out, oh wait, no, this is a totally different species that is specialized to this particular habitat, whether that's a habitat that looks the same but is located 50 to 100 miles away, or whether it's a habitat that's in a different altitude or something like that. So the small lemurs are the ones where there's still room for discovery. And my favorite thing about talking about different species is if you ask the curator of our fossil division, he has a very different definition of what makes a species. He's not worried about genetics so much as he is about how the bones are put together, what the animals probably ate, how they moved. So he would probably say there are fewer species of lemur, whereas the researchers out here, uh, like Dr. Uh, Lydia Green or Dr. Marina Blanco, who did some presentations with us on um, on exploring by the seat of your pants, they would say there are lots more species of lemurs because they're really interested in genetics. So it's an interesting question. Yeah, I just looked it up. So uh, just so you guys know too, so August, literally in August, they identified and have been announcing the newest uh, lemur species find. So it's a mouse lemur. So it's one you can literally, if you have a shirt pocket, you could fit the lemur inside your pocket and it could peek out with its little hands. They're adorable. I'll try and find a link to that that I can share with all of you when we're done. Uh, but do check out Matt Boris, Lydia Greens, Rena Blanco, like some amazing Duke Lemur Center presentations in our past. So if you want to learn more uh, nuance to the lemur story. I'm going to take a quick question from YouTube before I go to Miss D's class in Bowmanville. So Miss Wisniewski's class, their kindergarten class, joining us in Oshawa, uh, Ontario, and they want to know, why are lemurs' tails so long? So the lemur tail is so long. Sorry, we have some fun lemur drama I'm trying to follow, so let me follow first. So while you uh, were chatting and finding the question, Nacho, our spicy boy, came and started walking around on the roof of that enclosure, which bothered Francesca. So Francesca decided to hop out and chase him away from her food, but to no avail because it was just a distraction tactic because now mom Carolina is sneaking in to steal some of that food. So some pretty fun lemur drama going on here. Um, but to answer the question about the tails, the tail is definitely long to help them with balance. And it also can be a pretty clear signal of how they're feeling as Francesca was hopping away following Nacho. Her tail was swinging around to show that she was agitated. Um, but the main reason is for balance. And especially if you're making super impressive leaps across 20 feet like Francesca, or if you're like Nacho when you're walking along a narrow branch, having a long tail like that, he's actually using it right now. You can see him right there. As he moves and he starts to lose his balance, his tail swings around like a counterbalance. So if you think about when you see people walking on a tightrope and they have a long, long um, stick that they're using to help them balance a balancing pole, the tail is basically like a built-in balancing pole. Very cool. Thank you so much, Megan. And what a beautiful shot of it right there on the, on the tree. In fact, I'll leave it on you to highlight that. Uh, let's go to Ms. D's class, grade six, sevens in Bowmanville. If you guys have a question for us, come on up. Let's just de mute that mic and you're good to go. Hey guys. <laughs> there we go, it wants to work. So your mic's still muted, so we still can't hear you guys and I can't unmute it from where I am. You have to demute your own mic on the thing and then we'll be good to go. So all our teachers do demute you your mic. Hello. There you go, perfect, Ms. Dean. Hi. Hello. Uh, my question is, are any of these lemurs, are you able to train them at all? Because I didn't quite catch the question, could you repeat? Yeah. One more time, Ms. D. I know you guys are having big audio issues today. That's okay. Yeah, Ms. D, we didn't catch that. So what I'll do is, uh, Ms. D's class, if you guys want to type the question in the chat bar, I'll take it that way. I know your computer's having some issues today, um, and I'm sorry for that. So we'll take that question in just a minute, and I will go back to Madame Sarah's class in Ottawa. If you guys have a question for us, come on in, okay? How long do lemurs live for? Nice. That is another great question. And it's one of the big questions we always get on tours. And the, the truthful answer is it depends, but I'll give you a longer answer than that. Um, so it depends on a lot of factors. So we can talk about how long a certain species lives. We can talk about how long a lemur lives that lives here versus a lemur that lives in the wild in Madagascar. So I'll try to cover all those topics with a kind of a sweeping answer. 
So a mongoose lemur like Nacho in the wild would probably live maybe to their mid to late teens, maybe even into their 20s, depending on where they live in Madagascar. If they live somewhere that has a lot of deforestation or maybe has a high population of the fusa, which is the predator that mainly eats lemurs in Madagascar, they might live a little bit of a shorter life. Whereas if they live somewhere that's a nice big space with lots and lots of natural resources and not a lot of worries about deforestation, well, then that lemur might live a little longer into their 20s. Um, I've even heard reports of certain species of lemur living into their early 30s in the wild in Madagascar. Here at the Duke Lemur Center, we usually see our lemurs live into their mid to late 20s, if not their 30s. Um, so the exception to that would be the smaller lemurs. So mouse lemurs are going to live a lot shorter lifespan. Usually here they can live up until they're 12, 13, maybe even 14. In the wild, they may live much shorter lives. They could even live as short of a life as like five or six years old, depending on what's going on in the wild. There's one big exception to that. One small lemur that lives quite a long time are the dwarf lemurs. There's lots of different species. We have fat-tailed dwarf lemurs here. I highly recommend you check out um, Dr. Marino Blanco's talk on them. But dwarf lemurs are the only species group of primates that do a full hibernation. And because of that, their cells are a little bit different and they actually live quite a bit longer than other lemurs. Oh, nacho maneuvering above me. Um, so they live quite a bit longer than other lemurs and they actually can live into their mid to late 20s. So they're a big exception to that. So it's a bit of a long answer, um, but the short answer is it depends. Very cool. Thanks, Megan. All right, Miss D's class. You typed in the question, I'm gonna to come to you and we'll see if we can get it live. And if not, then I have it, I can share. Good luck. <laughs> Just demute your mic. We should be good to go. Fingers crossed. I'm eternally hopeful. <laughs> if there were no tech issues, it'd be no fun. It's half the fun of live podcasts, really. Uh, once or she'll just need to demute your mic. I don't know how delayed you guys are. Maybe that's part of it too. All right. <laughs> Are the lemurs able to be trained at all, or do you train them at all? Yeah. Yes. Great question. Thank you. Um, so, yes, the lemurs absolutely can be trained. So we use a method called positive reinforcement training. And actually, what you saw this morning was a form of training. So when Becca came out here with her bucket and she whistled, that is a method of training we use out here in the forest. And to live out here in the forest, you have to respond well to training because you have to come when Becca does that whistle tone, either come out here to your feeding site, go inside where the Shafak are hanging out, or go all the way back to the building. We actually practice that twice the week over the summer. We call those lockup days where everybody actually goes inside a space like this or inside the building. That way, when we get into hurricane season, which is looking pretty scary this year, or if we get into uh, the winter season when it's too cold for lemurs, we know that we can get them to come inside if the temperatures are going to be too low or if there's going to be stormy weather. So that's a big part of our training we do out here in the forest. We also can do all kinds of cool training. In fact, Pompeia, who is the mom cockerel shafak, and I'm not sure where she went. Okay, she's up on the other side over there. That's her daughter right here. Pompeia is a fantastic trainer, and I have had the privilege of watching her um, actually put herself in a net so uh, when we think of things like nets or we think of things like carriers or crates that we use to take a pet to the vet, we usually think those are bad things because the animals are usually scared of them. But the thing itself isn't bad. It's the thing you do with it that's bad. So if you only put your cat in their crate when they go to the vet, of course they don't like the crate very much. Oh, here's Pompeia. She heard we were talking about her. Um, she didn't really. They don't know their names. Um, so you can see that Pompeia um, is hanging out up on the roof there. So she's an excellent trainer, and she actually completely voluntarily, if her caretaker, Melanie, puts a net on the ground, Pompeo will hop right into the middle of it, let Melanie pull the net up around her, and let her pick her up, actually, inside of that net, all while Pompeo stays super calm. As long as there's lots of her favorite treat, which is peanuts, coming her way, she doesn't mind at all. She'll even let us lay the net over top of her. So if we needed to do something like give her an injection, like a rabies vaccine, she'd be okay. Um, so she's an excellent trainer. But all of that is done through positive reinforcement. We never force the lemurs when we're doing training because we know that that would be counterproductive. So when the lemurs don't feel like training, they don't get in trouble. They just don't get their treat. So positive reinforcement means if they do what we like them to do, then they get a treat afterwards. If they don't, oh, well, they just don't get their treat. And then we try again another day. 
Um, in fact, I think we're going to do a program on training pretty soon so you guys can learn more. Ooh, how exciting is that? What a great answer. Great question, guys. Also, I love the pose. Every time I go back to this, we get a lemur in the best pose ever. Um, so before we go on with any uh, uh, cool questions, I just wanted to share this awesome message uh, from the Gerner family on Facebook, uh, watching lemur videos over the last few months and a huge part of the homeschooling. So Megan, thank you to you and your team. This, it leads to reactions like this, and we live for that sort of thing. So thanks to the Gerner family, and thanks to you guys at the Duke Lemur Center. It's awesome. All right. Let's go back to Ms. Robinson's class. If you guys have another question for us, just come demute your mic. And you're good to go. Just you can ask there. What type of species is a fossa? Ah. If you didn't I catch that, what type of species is a fossa? Oh, it's a fossa. So <laughs> the unhelpful answer to that is a fossa is really only like a fossa. There's not much that it's related to um, closely, but the closest relative to the Fusa family would be something like a mongoose. So they're a very, very early carnivore. And if you guys want to look them up, it's spelled F-O-S-S-A. And it is a carnivore that almost looks cat-like, but it's not in the cat family. And I'd say it's, it would come up to maybe my knee. They're not very tall, maybe a foot and a half uh, tall, or maybe even Maybe in up to two feet. I'm not good at measurements, guys. You should look this up. But basically, they are a carnivore that arrived on the island of Madagascar a couple tens of millions of years after the lemurs did. And so they evolved specifically to eat the lemurs and other animals that live on Madagascar. And they can actually climb trees and turn around and climb back down a tree because they can flip their feet on the back backwards so they can hold on. And they're kind of a rusty brown color. Um, and they blend in really well in the trees. So that's my best way of describing it. And I'm hoping maybe Jesse can help me out by maybe posting how you spell it in the comments. Yeah, so I can put it in the banner. And I can also, if I just take two seconds here, I think this should work. I'll just share my screen and show it to you guys. There we go. In theory, go. this is showing up. So that's a Vusa. So they're they're like a turbo mongoose in the forest. They're very cool. <laughs> uh, awesome. All right. Let's come back to the thing. There we go. Um, Nice. So, Miss D's class. Okay. I know we're 30 seconds delayed, so ask a question. Come on up. We'll do it. It'll work. I swear. Let's see. Miss D's class, Bowmanville, you're good to go. Type it in the chat. Come on. It wants to work. <laughs> it's just building up anticipation. They have written it, too, so I can also share it that way. In fact, I'm going to do that. So, Miss D's class, they wanted to know... Uh, oh, they didn't share. That's another class. Jeez, Miss D's class, we're trying for you guys. <laughs> Any questions in Bowmanville? I'll give it another few seconds. Do, 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 do. Wants to work. Yes. Okay, come on in. Come on up. Do you mute your mic? Yep. <laughs> How often do they go to the bathroom? Ooh, excellent question. Um, you guys didn't know this, but I love talking about these kinds of things on programs because most people hate talking about these kinds of things, but they're very important and lots of research centers around this kind of stuff. So lemurs go to the bathroom all the time. In fact, during this program, I don't know if you guys have spotted it, but at least six or seven times there's been a lemur on camera going poop um so they are constantly um going to the bathroom you'll see them peeing and pooping all the time um and they tend to do it kind of throughout the day just like they graze throughout the day so i don't have an exact number for you but it feels to me like it's constant especially when i'm trying to get a nice pretty video for a program um, although some researchers actually spend their time following the lemurs around out here waiting for them to poop, so they might argue that it takes them forever to poop. So it depends on your perspective, I guess. Oh, Jesse, you're muted. Yes, I am. See, it's not just Ben that had the technical difficulties, it's me too. I'm just so glad we got another question from Misty's class. Thank you guys so much dealing with the delay and the audio difficulties. You guys rock. Way to go. Um, I'm going to take one more question before we wrap up. Uh, so, Madame Sarah's class, just by luck of the draw, if you guys have one more, I know you typed it in the chat bar, so come on in and uh, demute and you'll be good to go. Hey, yes, hi to you too. There you go. Yep. 
you mute that mic and we're all set. Nice. Are there any species that are extinct and what is threatening the lemur species? So glad about that. Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, so yes, we know that at least 17 species of lemur who have gone extinct within the last one or 2,000 years, some of them actually within the last few hundred years. In fact, I highly recommend you guys check out um, the talks from Dr. Matt Borths, who's our curator for our fossil division, because um, he talks quite a bit about this. Um, and he's actually going to be doing some talks coming up. And Carrie, our fossil preparator, is going to be doing a talk very soon on how she digs fossils out of rock and how she makes sure that they're nice and safe to continue. So just a little plug for our future fossil programs. Um, but studying fossils here at the lemur center is a very important part of understanding what's threatening the lemurs here. So in those 17 species of lemur that have gone extinct, many of them were actually giant lemur species. And that's something we see a lot when we look at evolutionary history and we look at the history of the world is large animals that need a lot of resources and a lot of space to stay alive tend to go extinct more quickly. So one of those lemurs that's actually an ancient ancestor of the cockerel shafak that we've seen bouncing around today was called Paleopropithecus. And Paleopropithecus was a large lemur that moved around through the trees, likely eating a lot of leaves. And then as the island uh, had humans start to come onto the island, somewhere between five and 10,000 years ago, there's some debate there on that, um, then the humans started clearing forest and also probably started hunting these large, slow moving animals that were moving around through the trees. And that's something that happened all over the world. It's something that happened here in North America. Um, and so that's just what happens when humans move to a new place. And so this animal was one of the ones that unfortunately went extinct. The threats that are currently facing lemurs, the biggest threat by and large is definitely forest loss, habitat loss because of something called Tavi, which is a slash and burn agriculture. Slash and burn agriculture is something you see all over the world, especially in um, earlier civilizations or in current more rural civilizations. And so slash and burn can be a sustainable method of farming, but it can also be very devastating to the environment. And so the way that it's done in Madagascar, because there's a very large population of people, there's about 26 million people living on this island. Um, they will slash uh, a patch of forest, they will burn it, that way the ash from that fire dumps a bunch of nutrients right into the ground, and then they will farm it for a couple of years, but after a few years, if you don't rotate the crops properly, if you don't have the means to do that, and you just need to grow and make food for your family, you can actually wind up using all the nutrients out of that patch of ground, and that way nothing wants to grow there, so it just lays there kind of like a sandy patch. And so unfortunately, that's a big threat facing lemurs. But I do want to say that that's why we do so much work directly in Madagascar. So we have a whole conservation division that works in Madagascar. We actually have uh, people working on the ground in Madagascar. Lantu is uh, the main coordinator for our program in Madagascar. And he was born and raised in Madagascar. And he helps with coordinating environmental education programs, coordinating farming uh, workshops where we can work on bringing in different practices, but still looking at what the Malagasy people who live in Madagascar need to grow and need to do to survive. So when we talk about conservation, I always want to make sure we mention habitat loss is a problem and it's a very big thing to worry about, but it's not our land. And we have to remember that the people who live there are part of the ecosystem too. So you always have to remember that conservation means working with people too. Yeah, that's an extremely important message, one that we've been highlighting increasingly in our conservation themed programs. Uh, I'd encourage anyone who's tuning in to check out Planet Madagascar and Laura Diara's talk. Uh, she's involved with the Duke Lemur Center, did an amazing talk on some actual activities in Madagascar uh, live there on the conservation that they're doing. So check out Laura Diara uh, and Planet Madagascar or Travis Steffens. So those are great talk to check out. Uh, Megan, before we wrap up, uh, we've been highlighting some really amazing wildlife today and so I wanted to take the chance to bring up uh, the info on the bottom of the page for our backyard bio program. So all September long, we're encouraging kids to get out explore their backyards, local parks, fields, streams, what have you, to document and share the wildlife near them. Uh, even 10 minutes out in nature, you can find a whole bunch of species. Share it with us on Twitter, iNaturalist, together with other classrooms. Lots of ways to take part, so we hope you guys can join us in that way soon. And without, with that, uh, Megan, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Any last message you want to share with us about leaders? Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And if anyone's interested in learning more about lemurs, in addition to the resources 
Jesse mentioned. We also have lots of really fun talks coming up about conservation, about fossils, and we also have a whole bunch of virtual programs you can find on our website. So if you just search the words uh, Duke Lemur, you'll find it, or you can use the link that Jesse just posted for us and check it out. So we'd love to teach you more about lemurs. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much again, Megan. We look forward to those amazing programs for all our students tuning in. Check those out in the coming weeks, and uh, we look forward to having you back. For now, everyone, bye. Hello again, everybody. Hello. <laughs> How many of you learned something? I did. I did. I know I did. <laughs> I, I was just amazed that there were so many different kinds of lemurs. Um, I'm going to look up that fossa, that animal that eats the lemurs. I think they look, they look kind of like a cougar to me, but smaller by the looks of it. Um, I want to look up the giant lemurs. I wonder how big giant lemurs are. I wonder if I could figure that out here real quick. Let me see if I can figure that out. I'm it was curious. interesting. I it was love inter things like that. It was interesting about the tails, about it being a balanced form for them. Yes. The long tails. <laughs> um, I have to go somewhere at... 1230. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna, we're about done. So whenever I just wanted to see if I can find it. Okay, I'm gonna have to look at it separately. But um, I do want to thank everybody for being here with us. I hope that you enjoyed our virtual trip to the Duke Lemur Center. It makes me want to go see them in real life. Yeah, and um, it was a familiar scene, you know, because we just travel all through there. So Right. I, Very yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> you make me jealous. I wish I had seen it already in, in real life. Oh. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for being with us. And for those of you that are on that are joining us on YouTube, I hope you'll tune into some of our other live programs. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. And, th and Bye. thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>